Hi, and welcome to this introduction to Pro-G, the noise-gating and expanding plug from FabFilter. As the name implies, noise gates were originally designed to reduce background noise levels. Here we have a distorted guitar part with a rather high noise floor that shows up clearly on the scrolling display. So, I'm going to set the threshold just above the background noise level. Pro-G now automatically reduces the gain whenever the signal drops below the threshold. So the noise is ducked during the pauses in my playing. The light blue area of the graph represents the output from the expander. Notice we can now see the dark blue input levels behind it, so we can easily tell which parts of the signal are being removed. We have various ways to tweak the behaviour if needed. The ratio knob controls the amount of gain reduction applied to quiet signals. The default setting is quite high, so as we can see from the transfer graph, the gain drops away quite quickly below the threshold. If I turn the ratio up all the way, we see the slope gets even steeper to create a hard gate, while turning it down creates gentler slopes for downwards expansion, which can sound more transparent in some situations. To the right we find a range control, which sets the maximum amount of gain reduction. The default setting is effectively a full mute. If I turn this down, we see a second knee appear on the graph to indicate the range limit. And in practice, a setting of around 20 dB is often enough. OK, here's a different guitar example. This time I've recorded a direct input from the guitar, and I'm using an amp simulator plug to add more distortion and cabinet emulation. In this case, it makes sense to insert Pro-G before the amp sim, in order to remove the noise before it gets boosted by the extra distortion stage. As usual, I'll start by setting a suitable threshold. But this time, I'll also switch to the guitar style, which is designed specifically for this type of application. This style works especially well with lower ratio expansion type settings to gently ride the gain down as the notes decay. We also have other styles available. Clean is a good choice when you want to minimise distortion, perhaps for a full mix. And here we see my voiceover track being processed using the vocal style. Each style represents a different algorithm, which has been optimised for that application, and they all use different amounts of hysteresis to prevent the gate opening and closing rapidly when the signal hovers around the threshold. Of course, sometimes the unwanted signal is not noise, but spill from other instruments. Here we have a snare drum close mic, with a little too much hi-hat spill. So I'll set the threshold to let only the snare hits through the gate. And I'll turn up the attack time a little to make sure we don't lose the snappy transients at the start of each hit. This is an easy example, however. If the drummer plays a lot of ghost notes, it may be harder to find a threshold setting that doesn't gate out the gentler hits as well. I'm therefore going to click the expert button to slide open the bottom panel. Turn on listen mode so I can listen to the side chain instead of the main signal path and wind down the low pass filter. The gate is now listening to just the low and mid frequencies from the snare drum and ignoring the high frequencies from the hi-hats, so it's much easier to find a suitable threshold setting. Low pass filtering the side chain can sometimes make the gate open too slowly, however, so we may start to lose the initial transients of the sound even with the fastest attack time. In this case, try turning on look ahead mode to make the gate open a little early. A couple of milliseconds should do in this case. Be aware that enabling look ahead mode adds 10 milliseconds of latency to the signal path, but most modern DAWs will compensate for this automatically when mixing. Let's have another example, this time an inside kick drum mic. Spill isn't really a problem in this case, but I'm going to use the gate more creatively to shape the dynamics. I'll stick with the default style, which is modelled on classic analogue designs, and set the threshold to catch just the drum hits. Now notice what happens as I tweak the attack knob. Slower settings will soften the attack of the drum, and conversely, very fast settings will tighten up the attack and can add a little extra click to the start of each hit. This can be very useful when mixing heavy guitar styles of music, which often require artificially clicky and aggressive kick drum sounds. The range knob can now be used to tune precisely the amount of click added. Reducing the range reduces the gain change at the start of each hit, so we'll also reduce the click. But we can fine tune it further by reducing the ratio, 
or softening the knee, or by opening up the expert panel again and using the high pass filter to remove the slower sub bass frequencies. Of course, you may need to lower the threshold a bit as well to compensate. We also have an outside kick mic. This has much more spill, so this time I'm going to drag a send from the inside kick channel and route it to the extra sidechain inputs. Then I'll open the expert panel again and switch the sidechain to external mode. This gate is now processing the outside mic, but is using the relatively spill-free inside mic to decide when to open. And I can now use the hold and release knobs to precisely tune the decay. The sidechain inputs also provide many other creative possibilities. I'm going to add another Pro G for the room mic, and this time I'll drag a send from the snare drum and route it to the extra inputs again. I can now make the room mics louder on every snare hit, while keeping a relatively dry and tight sound for the rest of the kit. Another side chaining trick helps to define a whole musical genre. I'm going to send a sustained pad sound to the main input, and then route a percussive part to the side chain. And our pad is now chopped up to create classic rhythmic trance gate effects. We can also create similar effects without using the side chain inputs at all. If MIDI is enabled at the bottom left of the panel, Pro G will respond to note data, so we can simply route a suitable MIDI part directly to the plug to define the gating pattern. OK, so far we have been using Pro G with noise gate or downwards expansion settings. These both increase the dynamic range of the signal by turning down quiet signals while leaving loud signals untouched. There is another type of expansion, however. If I switch the style to upward, we can expand the dynamic range from the other direction by turning up loud signals while leaving quiet signals untouched. The most obvious use of upward mode is rescuing material that has been compressed a bit too hard. Upward expansion can be thought of as the direct opposite of downwards compression, so with a little care you may be able to restore some of the lost dynamics. Upward mode has many other uses, however. This time I'm processing a stereo mix of the whole drum kit. You may have noticed that the drums in my earlier example were actually coming from a plug-in rather than a real drum kit. However, even a carefully programmed MIDI part with a good quality sample library can sometimes sound a bit safe compared to a real drum. A little upward expansion can often help to add some of that missing excitement and make the part seem less artificial. Another example. This time I'm processing the whole mix with a fast attack time, a very gentle low ratio, and a range setting of only 3 dB. A little goes a long way with upward expansion techniques, and gain changes of just 1 dB or less can sometimes have a significant effect on the sound. In this case I'm adding a touch of extra definition, and a little more depth and dimension. And I've turned down the wet level knob a touch to compensate for the gain boosts, and allow me to judge the difference when I bypass it. Notice the two gain controls to the left of the expert panel. These don't actually affect the signal path directly. In fact, they control the levels for the side chain. If I turn the gain for the right channel all the way down, the side chain level drops by 36 dB, which is exactly the same as increasing the threshold by 36 dB for just that channel. And likewise, boosting the side chain gain is equivalent to reducing the threshold level by the same amount. Each of these gain controls also has a mix ring around the outside. This controls the mix of the two channels feeding the side chain detected. By default, these are both centered, so both side chains are listening to the same mono mix of left and right, and we get identical gain modulation for both channels. If I hold the Alt key, I can adjust these both at the same time in opposite directions. Now the left side chain is hearing only the left channel, while the right side chain is hearing only the right channel, so we now have dual mono expanders instead of one stereo. I'm going to switch to mid-side now instead of left-right. Our stereo signal is now represented as the sum of both channels, plus the difference between them. If I turn down the gain for the side-side chain, our expansion is now only affecting centrally panned elements of the mix, like the drums or the bass. And because the mix ring for that channel is all the way to the left, 
The expansion is also triggered only by those same centrally panned elements. Conversely, I could set the side gain back to unity and turn down the mid gain instead. Now the expansion is only affecting the wide stereo parts of the mix. And because the side mix ring is all the way to the right, the expansion is being keyed by those same wide stereo elements. This setting will exaggerate any wide stereo passages by making them even wider. Now notice what happens if I set the mix ring all the way to the left instead. So the side side chain listens only to the mid channel. The expansion is still only affecting the wide stereo elements of the mix, but now it's being keyed by the main centrally panned elements of the mix instead. This is a good way to enhance the natural ambience of a recording and can add a great sense of depth and space without resorting to artificial reverb. Of course, this type of processing necessarily involves very fast gain changes, which by definition will introduce aliasing. Upward expansion of a full mix like this may well benefit from the two times or four times oversampling options at the bottom, which will significantly reduce aliasing at the expense of higher CPU use and slightly higher latency. With oversampling and look ahead turned off, however, Pro-G doesn't add any extra latency and is safe to use for live input channels while tracking if needed. That's all I've got time for in this video. If you need more help, you can launch a detailed manual via the help menu at the top. And if you enable interactive help hints, you can get a pop-up description of each parameter by hovering the mouse cursor over it. And of course, there's a comprehensive selection of factory presets available to get you started. Thanks for watching.